Hey everyone and welcome to the Retro Channel. This right here is a device that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. It is the Mini Pro TL866 programmer. Now this is really handy if you ever need to test any logic ICs or ROM chips or obviously program those things, but it only really supports a limited set of devices. Now when it comes to a lot of 8-bit systems, they use a 24-pin ROM chip and this out of the box does not support those. Another thing it doesn't support, even though it's technically just some logic, is the Commodore 64 PLA. So today we're going to have a look at an adapter so we can actually read back the 24 pin ROM ICs and even maybe create a cartridge image from one of them. And we're also going to have a look at how we can test a Commodore 64 PLA just using this device. So um, let's dive in and take a look. All right, so first things first, let's just see how it works with the Commodore 64 PLA. Now this tip comes from Mark5, aka Pascal, who was watching the last Commodore 64 repair live stream and mentioned this was possible with the Mini Pro. So the actual person who's done most of the work here is L Break Into Program, who also has a YouTube channel and he's actually shown this on his channel before but he also has on his website a logic table for the Mini Pro that we just need to download. So I'll put a link to this down in the description, but all we need to do is just grab this logic table and open up the zip file. And all we need is this PLA LGC file. So I'm just gonna copy that. I'll just throw it on the desktop here. And then we'll just open up the programmer software, head into the logic table test, and we're gonna import our little logic file. So this one right here. We'll see import chips from file one, which means it's detected a file, duh. And it'll show up at the bottom of the list. So all we need to do now is make sure our PLA is installed correctly the right way up and just hit test. And we can see that all vector testing is normal. So all the expected results from the inputs have been read on the outputs and that PLA should be good. Now there are some odd timing things that could mess up a PLA. So even though the logic may seem correct, um, there could be a hidden issue that you wouldn't know about um, possibly not even when first powering on the Commodore 64, it might take a while for that to manifest uh, into an actual error. Now, this does also work with the GAL PLA. Um, and of course, if you've got a Mini Pro, it's pretty easy to make up one of these GAL PLAs. I'll leave a link on how to do that in the description as well. But if we stick this in here, this one's obviously already programmed as a PLA hit test. Once again, everything's normal there. And it should also work with some other replacement PLAs. For example, this one is the Oz PLA. And I think that's the right way up. Would help if they put a little indicator somewhere, but yep, again, that works. And just for fun, here's some PLAs that have marked as bad. So let's test these out. Ooh, okay, and this one has failed on everything. So that's definitely an issue. I mean, it could be a bad connection, but you know, I've already marked this as bad. So I'm pretty sure I was certain on that. Let's have a look at this one. This one has failed due to overcurrent protection. So it would indicate that there's some kind of internal short in this PLA. And that's definitely bad. There's no coming back from that really. And one more for fun. All right, this failed a couple of tests, not all of them, but yeah, a few of them have failed. So again, that is a dead PLA. So yeah, that is Commodore 64 PLA testing. Um, it's actually quite simple. Now, the other thing I wanted to look at was uh, simple logic like the 74 LS257 here. So to test other logic, you just want to put 74 and then whatever that 
number is. So you leave out the LS or the HC or whatever. Um, if you're unsure, um, check the uh, VCC voltage for your chip. LS chips operate at five volts. So if we put in 74257 and hit test, um, this one has failed. I'm pretty sure this was a good IC. So we'll just reseat that. Okay, there we go. Everything's normal with this one, which it should be. Here is a faulty one, for example, the same, same style of logic. And yes, it fails on two tests. All right, now when it comes to reading 24 pin ROM chips, uh, we do need to build a little adapter, which is what I've done here. This basically wires uh, address lines 11 and 12 to the correct places uh, on a 24 pin ROM IC, and it also just connects VCC. So the Mini Pro is gonna think that this is a 28 pin ROM, uh, whereas we're actually gonna have a 24 pin ROM stuck in it. And I've also taken the liberty of adding a ZIF socket just to make everything a little bit easier for myself. So there it is, that's our little tower of power. Let's start off with, I think this is the Commodore 64 basic ROM. So we'll stick all this in the Mini Pro, making sure that everything is the right way up. Lock that down and then lock this guy down. Now on the actual Mini Pro software itself, we're gonna select the AMD 27C64, which is obviously a 28 pin ROM, uh, which is what the Mini Pro is gonna think it is because it doesn't support 24 pins. And you just wanna make sure the check ID and pin detect are turned off because it's obviously not gonna match the ID of the EEPROM that it's expecting. And it's also not gonna have all the pins uh, that a 28 pin would. So. Make sure those options are turned off. You don't have to worry too much about these over here as long as our VCC is at five volts. Um, we're not gonna be trying to program anything this way. And after that, you just wanna hit read. And if everything works, you should be able to see uh, the ROM read back. And we can also see some of the ASCII code here. So yeah, that looks like your pretty standard Commodore uh, basic ROM. Now, if we wanted to verify that against a known good ROM, um, Google is your friend there. If you uh, head over to Zimmers, or even if you just Google the ROM IC number, which on this ROM is 901226-01, chances are you're gonna find the uh, original ROM image quite easily. So let's grab Commodore 64 basic ROM, download that. And then all we need to do is load that into XG Pro. When I find it. Load that in and then we can just hit verify, which will check that against the ROM that we've got in here and verify finish. So this IC is good, fully working. Um, a little, something a little bit different is the Commodore 64 character ROM. This is a four kilobyte ROM, so 32 kilobits. So it's half the size of the basic ROM. So this will also work, uh, but there is a little bit of a trick to this because we're still reading it as an eight kilobyte or 64 kilobit ROM it means that the first half of the image is just blank. It just shows FFF. The way we can get around this is actually to save this and we're just gonna call it something simple. Um, throw it on the desktop here. We'll just call it C64char. So we've saved that on the desktop. Let's go grab the original ROM image, uh, which should be pretty easy to find. It is 901.225-01. So you can see it's a 2532 ROM type. 
that's downloaded. What I'm going to do now is use HXD, which is a simple hex editor. Uh, it's available for free. We're going to open up the image that we pulled from this ROM, which obviously has the first half blank. And we're just going to highlight and delete the first half of that image all the way up to FFF. Uh, so you can see that the ROM pretty much starts from the second half. So just highlight all that, hit delete and OK. And then all we're going to do is go into analysis and compare this with the ROM that we just downloaded. I'm not sure if I have to save that first. Guess we'll find out. Chosen files are identical, so I didn't have to save it, but yeah, there you go. Our ROM that we read from this chip and chopped off the first half matches exactly the character ROM that's available online. So we know that is also good. Now, of course, it'll work for other systems as well. It's not all Commodore stuff. For instance, this is the Tandy Coco one. I think it is the extended basic ROM, but there's an easy way to find out. Let's read it back and have a look. Usually there's some ASCII text at the start that we can tell. Here we go, extended color basic 1.0. Now, once again, I'm sure you'll be able to find a ROM image online. Um, there is a place that has quite a lot of them available. I won't put the link to that down in the description. I'm sure you can use your eyeballs for this one. Just, um, you know, this is all mostly still copyrighted material, so I don't want to uh, push any buttons, but let's just see. Extended basic 1.1. I think, did we have 1.0 here? Extended color basic 1.0. Hmm. I'm guessing one of these files, oh, that's got 1.1. Coco E, Coco E. Extended basic 1.0. All right, let's move this out to the desktop. It's in dot rom. I don't know if that's going to be an issue. Mm, maybe not. Okay, that looks the same. Let's verify it. No. There are two bytes that are different. 1981. So let's just read our ROM again. Yeah, okay. Extended basic 1.0, copyright 1980 by Tandy. And the one that we download is copyright 1981. Interesting. So yeah, that could be a case of maybe we should upload this version as well. Although literally the only difference is that date code. And one other byte, maybe we should look at. So it's at address 162C. 162C must be around here. Okay. The different byte doesn't look like it's much at all. 162C, yeah. That byte there, I think. 86. What was this one? 96. I don't know, you know, what function that does or if it does anything at all. Maybe it's just a checksum or something. Who knows? But um, yeah. Backing up ROM ICs, especially 24 pin ones, is a lot easier thanks to this. And likewise, if we take a common cartridge like this one here, which happens to be my favorite piece of software for the Commodore 64, good old financial advisor. We've got a 24 pin ROM. Is this going to come out easily? Yes, it is. So we can stick this in here. 
read it back. Looks good, bunch of stuff there. And we can even save this and convert it into a cartridge image, cartridge image to run in something like Vice. So let's just save that as FA. We'll get rid of this for now. And if we navigate into our copy of Vice, obviously you have to download Vice if you don't have it already. And if we look in the bin folder, there is actually a program called CartConv. So we're gonna use that to convert our little bin file, which I'll just move into this folder just to make it easier. We can use that to turn our bin into a cart image. Oops, we need to move to that folder. And uh, there is a bit of info, you know, help in this program because it's not as straightforward as just dropping it onto the program or something like that. You do actually have to specify the type of cartridge uh, that you want output. In most cases, that is pretty simple. Uh, so we want to specify our cart type. Most of the time it's just normal. And our input file was fa.bin and output, uh, we can just output it as fa.crt. And it looks like that was successful. So if we now open up the Commodore 64 emulator, this laptop is very slow. Uh, there it is there, fa.cart. We can just drop that onto the emulator. And there we go, financial advisor from here into there. And uh, now that is backed up and saved forever. Thank God for that. Wouldn't want to lose such a useful program. Now, as I mentioned, there are a lot of other systems that will have 24 pin ROM chips. Obviously, the Cocos. I mean, the Atari 8-bit lines use a lot. VIC-20. That is how we can use the Mini Pro to test not only Commodore 64 PLAs, but to also back up uh, and verify 24 pin ROM ICs. Now, of course, there are other devices like the Retro Chip Tester Pro and the Backbit Chip Tester, and they will do even more than what the Mini Pro can do. But this is, you know, kind of handy, especially if you're not doing a huge amount of stuff and you don't want to make the investment into those products and you've already got the Mini Pro. Well, you know, you've got half your options sorted. I think personally, I'm just delaying the inevitable, which would be probably building the Retro Chip Tester Pro for myself. But um, yeah, until then, this kind of still suits my needs. Anyway, we'll see how that goes. Now, some of you may notice down the bottom of the screen that there was version 11.6 of the Mini Pro software, uh, but Windows actually blocked it from downloading because it found a virus in it. So I'm still sticking on version 11.5. I have no idea if that's just a false positive or what, but um, yeah, I'd recommend avoiding version 11.6 and uh, either finding a mirror or if you're already on it, version 11.5. I think you need at least version 10 in order to import your own um, logic tables. So keep that in mind. Um, apart from that, I think that is about it. So um, I'd like to give a big shout out and thanks to my patrons who support the channel. And thank you to everyone else who likes, subscribes, leaves friendly comments. And um, yeah, if you'd like to support the channel and keep this show running, then uh, links to that are down below. But until next time, thank you for watching the Retro Channel. Bye.